Good morning, students. Today we will see about the adaptation of newborn at birth. The neonatal period includes the time from the birth to 8, 28, the 28 days of life. The most profound physiological changes required of the neonate is the transition from fetal or plasmal circulation to independent respiration. The loss of plasmal connection means loss of complete metabolic support, especially supply of oxygen and removal of carbon dioxide. The normal stresses of labor and delivery produce alterations in plasmal gas exchange patterns, acid-base balance in the blood and cardiovascular activity in the infant. Physiological adjustment tasks are those that involve establish and maintain the respirations, adjusting the circulatory changes, regulating the temperature, ingesting, retaining and digesting nutrients, eliminating waste and regulating the weight. The transition to extrauterine life, the major adaptation associated with transition from intrauterine life occurs in the first 6 to 8 hours after birth. The predictable series of events during the transition are mediated by sympathetic nervous system and result in changes that involve heart rate, respirations and temperature and gastrointestinal functions. This transition period represents a time of vulnerability for the neonate and warrants careful observation by the nurses. The first stage of transition period lasts up to 30 minutes after birth and is called a period of reactivity. The newborn's heart rate increases rapidly to 160 to 180 beats per minute but gradually falls after 30 minutes or so to baseline rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute. The respirations are irregular with a rate between 60 to 80 breaths per minute. The fine crackles can be present on auscultation. Audible grunting, nasal flaring and retractions of the chest also can be present but this could, should cease within the first hour of life. After the period of reactivity, the newborns either sleeps or have a marked decrease in motor activity. This period of decreased responsiveness lasts from 60 to 100 minutes. During this time, the infant is pink and respirations are rapid and shallow but unlabored. The second period of reactivity occurs roughly between 2 to 8 hours after birth and lasts for from 10 minutes to several hours. Brief periods of tachycardia and tachypnea occur associated with the increased muscle tone, changes in the skin color and mucus production. The immediate adjustment of physiological adaptation. The first one is the respiratory system. The most critical and immediate physiological change required of the newborn is the onset of breathing. The stimuli that helps initiate the first breath are primarily chemical and thermal. The chemical factors in the blood that means the low oxygen and high carbon dioxide and low pH initiate impulses that excite the respiratory center in the medulla. The primary thermal stimulus is a sudden chilling of the infant who leaves the warm environment and enters a relatively cooler atmosphere. This abrupt change in temperature excites the sensory impulse in the skin that transmitted to the respiratory center. The tactile stimulation may assist in initiating the respiration. Descent through the birth canal and normal handling during delivery helps stimulate the respiration in uncompromised infants. Acceptable methods of tactile stimulation include slapping or flicking the soles of the feet or gently rubbing the infant's back, trunk or extremities. Initial air entry of air into the lungs is opposed by surface tension of the fluid that are filled in the fetal lungs and alveoli. Some lung fluid may also remove during normal process forces of labor and delivery. As the chest emerges from the birth canal, fluid is squeezed from the lungs to the nose and mouth. After complete delivery of the chest, brisk recoil of the thorax occurs and air enters the upper airway to replace the lost fluid. Remaining lung fluid is absorbed by pulmonary capillaries and lymphatic vessels. In the alveoli, the surface tension of the fluid is reduced by surfactant, a surface produced by alveolar epithelium that cuts the alveolar surface. Second is the circulatory system. An important as the initiation of respiration are the circulatory changes that allow blood to flow through the lungs. These changes, which occur more gradually, are the result of pressure changes in the lungs, heart, and major vessels. The transition from fetal to postnatal circulation involves functional closure of fetal shunts, that is, foramen ovale, the ductus arteriosus, and eventually ductus venosus. Increased blood flow dilates the pulmonary vessels 
primary vascular resistance decreased and systemic resistance increased thus maintaining blood pressure. As the pulmonary vessels receive blood, the blood pressure in the right atrium and right ventricle in the pulmonary artery decreases. Left atrial pressure increases above the right atrial pressure with subsequent foramen or will closure. With the increase of pulmonary vascular resistance, the ductus arteriosus begins to close. The most important factors controlling ductal closure are the increased oxygen concentration of the blood and fall in endogenous prostaglandins. The foramen or will closes functionally at or soon after birth. The ductus arteriosus is closed functionally by fourth day. Anatomic closure takes considerably longer. Failure of ductus arteriosus to foramen or will to close result in persistence of fetal shunting of blood away from the lungs. Third one is thermoregulation. Next to establishing respiration, heat regulation is the most critical to newborn survival. Although newborn's capacity for heat production is adequate, three factors predispose the newborn to excessive heat loss. First one, newborn's large surface area facilitates the heat loss to the environment. Although this is partially compensated by for the newborn's usual position of flexion, which decreases the amount of surface area exposed to the environment. The newborn's thin layer of subcutaneous fat provides poor insulation for the conservation of heat. Newborn's mechanism for producing heat is different from the adult who can increase heat production to an adult who can increase heat production through shivering. The chilled neonate cannot shiver but provides heat through non-shivering thermogenesis which involves increased metabolism and oxygen consumption. The principal thermogenic source are the heart, liver and brain. In addition, source unique to the newborn is known as the brown adipose tissue or brown fat. Brown fat which owes its name to a larger content of mitochondrial cytochromes have a larger capacity for heat production to the intensified metabolic activity than does ordinary adipose tissue. Heat generated in brown fat is distributed to the other parts of the body by blood which is warm as it is flow through the layers of tissue. Superficial deposits of brown fat are located between the scapula, around the neck, in the axilla and behind the sternum. Deeper layers surrounded in the kidney, trachea, esophagus, some major arteries and adrenals. The location of brown fat may explain why the nape of the neck often feels warmer than rest of the infant's body. Because of these factors predisposing infant to loss of body heat, it is essential newborn infants are quickly tried and either provided with warm dry blanket or placed skin to skin with their mother after delivery. The fourth one is hemopoietic system. The blood volume of the newborn depends on the amount of plasmal transfer of the blood. The blood volume of a full term infant is about 80 to 85 ml per kg of body weight. Immediately after birth, the total blood volume averages 300 ml but depending upon how long cord clamping delay as much as 100 ml can be added to the blood volume. Fifth one is fluid and electrolyte balance. Changes occurs in total body water volume, extracellular fluid volume and intracellular fluid volume during the transition from fetal to postnatal life. At birth, the total weight of infant is 73% of fluid compared with 50% in adult. The infant has proportionally higher ratio of Extra means extracellular fluid than the adult and consequently have a higher level of total body sodium and chloride and a lower level of potassium, magnesium and phosphate. An important aspect of fluid balance is relationship to the other system. In addition, the rate of fluid exchange being seven times greater in the infant than in the adult, infant's rate of metabolism is twice as much as acid is formed leading to more rapid development of acidosis. In addition, the the immature kidneys cannot sufficiently concentrate urine to conserve the body water. These factors make the infant more prone to dehydration, acidosis and possible overhydration or water intoxication. The fifth, sixth one is gastrointestinal system. The ability of the newborns to digest, absorb and metabolize food stuff is adequately but limited in certain functions. Enzymes are adequate to handle the proteins or simple carbohydrates but deficient production of pancreatic amylase impairs the use of complex carbohydrates. Deficiency of pancreatic lipids limits the absorption of fat especially with the ingestion of food with high saturated 
fatty acid contents just cow's milk human milk despite of the high fat content is easily digested because it contains enzymes just lipids which assist in digestion the liver is most immature of GIT organ. The activity of enzyme gluconeal transferase is reduced which affect the conjugation of bilirubin with the glucuronic acid and contribute to the physiological jaundice of newborn. The liver also deficient in forming plasma proteins. The decreased plasma protein concentration probably plays a role in edema usually seen at birth. Prothrombin and higher coa other coagulation factors also low. The liver stores less glycogen at birth than later in life. Consequently, newborn is prone to develop hypoglycemia which may be prevented by early and effective feeding, especially breastfeeding. Some salivary glands are functioning at birth but majority do not begin to secrete saliva until the age of 2 to 3 months. When drooling is frequent, stomach capacity is limited to 190 ml. This infant requires small frequent feedings. The colon has a small volume. The newborn may have bowel movement after each feeding. Newborn who breastfeed usually have more frequent feedings and more frequent stools than infant who receive formula feeds. The infant intestine is longer in relation to body size than that of the adult. Therefore, there are larger number of secretory glands and large surface area for absorption as compared with the adult intestine. Infants have rapid peristaltic waves and stem simultaneous non-peristaltic waves along the entire esophagus which propel nutrients forward. The relative immaturity of peristaltic waves combined with decreased lower esophagus pincher pressure, inappropriate relaxation of lower esophageal sphincter and delayed gastric emptying make regurgitation a common occurrence. The neonatal GI mucosa may perform an important function as barrier to foreign antigen. Both immune and non-immune factors may play a vital role in decreasing the absorption of antigens capable of causing serious neonatal illness. However, the functional capacity of this system may be immature or impaired. Feeding the neonate with breast milk may increase the effectiveness of this defense mechanism. Seventh one is renal system. All structural components are present in the renal system, but there is a functional deficiency in the kidney's ability to concentrate urine and to cope up with conditions of fluid and electrolyte stress such as dehydration or a concentrated solute load. Total volume of urine per 24 hour is about 200 to 300 ml by the end of first week. The urine is colorless, odorless and have a specific gravity of 1.020. Indigmentary system. At birth, all structures within the skin are present, but many of the functions of indigmentary system are immature. The outer two layers of skin, that is the epidermis and dermis, are loosely bound to each other and very thin. The slight friction on the skin, the rapid removal of adhesive tape, can cause separation of these layers and blister formation. Sebaceous glands are very active late in fetal life and early infancy because of high levels of metal androgens. The most defensively located on the scalp, face and genitalia and produce greasy vernis caseosa that covers the infant at birth. Plugging of sebaceous glands cause media. Because of the amount of melanin is low at birth, newborns are lighter skin than they be as children. Consequently, they are more susceptible to harmful effects of the sun. In the ninth one is musculoskeletal system. At birth, the skeletal system contains larger amount of cartilage than ossified bones, although the process of ossification is fairly rapid in the first year. Unlike skeletal system, muscular system is almost completely formed at birth. Growth in size of muscular tissue is caused by hypertrophic rather than hyperplasia of the cells. Tenth one is the defense against infection. The first line of defense is the skin and mucous membranes which protect body from invading organisms. The mature neonatal intestinal mucosal barrier may also play a vital role as the important defense mechanism against antigen. 
The second line of defense macrophage system which produce several types of cells capable of attacking at pathogens like neutrophils, monocytes and eosinophils. The third line of defense is the formation of specific antibodies to an antigen. Exposure to various foreign agents is necessary for antibody production to occur. Infants are generally not capable of producing their own immunoglobin until beginning of the second month of life. But they receive considerable passive immunity in the form of IgG from the maternal circulation and from the breast milk. We learn this endocrine system. Generally, the endocrine system of a newborn is adequately developed but its functions are immature. Third one is neurological system. At birth, the nervous system is incompletely integrated but sufficiently developed to sustain extrauterine life. Most neurologic functions are primitive reflexes. The autonomic nervous system is crucial during transition because it stimulates the initial respiration, helps maintain acid-base balance and partially regulates temperature control. Myelination of the nervous system follows cephalocaudal proximo distal that is head to toe center to periphery loss of development and is closely related to observe the mastery of fine and gross motor skills. Myelin is necessary for rapid and efficient transmission of some but not all nerve impulses along the neural pathway. The tracts that develop myelin earliest are sensory, cerebellar and extrapyramidal tracts. This account for an acute sensory of taste, smell and hearing in the newborn as well as perception of pain. All cranial nerves are present and myelinated except for optic and olfactory nerves. Thank you for listening. If you have any doubts, please do comment me.